مساء الخير إلى جميع المشاهدين 1978 أبصرت هي نور الحب 1999 انطفأ هو إلى جانب نور حياته واحد وعشرون عاما مرت بسرعة النور وتماما مثل الحلم واحد وعشرون عاما تربعت بكامل بهائها ملكة على قلب ملك توجه بحبه فخفقت بحبها قلوب الأردنيين والشعب العربي والمجتمع الدولي على حد سواء إلى المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية وصلت حملة معها نفحات من الحداثة وثقافة الغرب والحيوية والحياة فكان اللقاء أبديا مع ملك الحداثة والأفكار التقدمية ومن الأردن انطلقت كحمامة سلام تزرع إيمانها وعملها في كل مكان وعين مليكها ترعاها كما يحمي الرمش العين بعينيها الزرقوتين كسماء الأردن الصافية وبتسريحتها المموجة بوهج الشمس وابتسامتها الدافئة كمشاعر القلب تشرق علينا ملكة من نور لا يخبو للمرة الأولى صاحبة الجلالة الملكة نور الحسين تطل معنا الليلة عبر شاشة عربية لتنير لنا بعضا من محطات حياتها ولنستنير برؤيتها حول أهم القضايا التي أولتها اهتمامها والتي لا تزال تسخر في سبيل إنجاحها كافة طاقاتها وعلاقاتها وإيمانها وفي البداية هذا التقرير المصور أشاعت كنور صباحي في واشنطن الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية في 23 أغسطس من العام 1951 إليزابيث الحلبي إنها أول فرحة نجيب الحلبي ودوريس كاركويست الأم السويدية الأصل والأب الطيار الأمريكي من أصل سوري المولود عام 1915 في تكساس برع في كل شيء عمل فيه بعد نظره وثقته بنفسه جعلته يتبوأ أهم المراكز في مجال الملاحة الجوية ساعد على الإعداد لتشكيل حلف الناتو في عهد ترومان ثم أصبح نائب مساعد وزير الدفاع لشؤون الأمن الدولي في عهد الرئيس أيزنهاور في العام 1960 تولى منصب المدير المسؤول لإدارة الطيران الفيدرالي ليصبح بذلك خبير الشؤون الملاحية في إدارة الرئيس كينيدي ثم رئيس مجلس إدارة شركة بانامريكان في كنف هذا الأب عاشت ليزا الحلبي طفولة سعيدة وسط شقيقيها كريستيان وأليكسا وأصبحت المراهقة البرجوازية المترفة التي تضج بالحياة والأحلام ورحلات التزلج إلى سويسرا والنمسا والمدارس الخاصة النخبوية اكتسبت العلم والذكاء اللذين تسلحت بهما عام أربعة وسبعين عندما حازت شهادة في فن العمارة وتخطيط المدن من جامعة برينستون فطارت فاردة جناحيها لتحقق طموحاتها المهنية بين الولايات المتحدة وأستراليا ثم نحو الشرق الأوسط إلى إيران والأردن أرض الأجداد قدرها قرأه لها عراف في فنجان قهوتها المقلوب في طهران فأعلن لها أنها ستتزوج من رجل أرستقراطي من بلاد الجدود لقاؤها الأول بالملك حسين بن طلال تم بالصدفة على أرض مطار عمان يومها كانت ليزا تزور والدها الموجود في الأردن بهدف وضع أسس إنشاء جامعة طيران عربية فجأة وصل الملك واقترب منها للتحية فدفع نجيب الحلبي بالكاميرا بين يدي ابنته وقال لها التقط لي صورة مع الملك لم تتصور ليزا الحلبي أن تلك الصورة ستقلب حياتها رأساً على عقب وستغير صورتها جذرياً وستضعها داخل إطار ذهبي كتاج مرصع على رأس ابنة السابعة والعشرين ربيعاً هكذا هو الحب دائماً 
لا يعترف بالحواجز والعراقيل والمسافات والاختلافات والعمر والدين هكذا هو انتصار الحب الذي تحول عصراً سحرياً شقلب حياتها في 15 يونيو 78 وحولها من امرأة عادية إلى ملكة متوجة على عرش المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية وعلى قلب الملك الحسين بن طلال ولأنها أشرقت في حياته وحياة أولاده من زيجاته الثلاث السابقة فملأتها بهجة وحياة وحداثة ونورا أصبحت ليزا الحلبي نوره نور الحسين لقد أصبحت أم أولاده الأمراء حمزة وهاشم وإيمان ورايا وشريكته في اعتماد سياسة الاعتدال والحداثة والانفتاح ورفيقة دربه الطويل نحو تحقيق السلام في الشرق الأوسط ونصفه الآخر المكمل له في الأنشطة الخيرية والاجتماعية والإنمائية والاقتصادية والثقافية والسفيرة غير الرسمية للأردن في العالم في السابع من فبراير عام 1999 انطفأت شعلة الحياة في عيني الملك حسين بعد صراع مع مرض السرطان لكن الملكة ظلت وسوف تظل نوراً مشعة لروح الحسين ورسالته والقضايا التي ناديا بها صاحبة الجلالة مساء الخير بيسعدني وبيشرفني اني حاوريك وتكون الليلة هذه المقابلة أول إطلالة تلفزيونية لك عبر محطة عربية أنا بشكر ثقتك فيي الحوار رح يكون باللغة الإنجليزية وأصدقائي المشاهدين رح تتابعوا الترجمة إلى العربية على أسفل هذه الشاشة عناوين عريضة محاور مختلفة التطرف صراع الحضارات الحياة مع الملك حسين الحياة بعد الملك حسين كل هذه المواضيع رح نتطرق لها مع جلالة الملكة نور الحسين في هذه المقابلة نحن الليلة في قصر باب السلام العابق بالذكريات والشامخ كشموخ صاحب القصر المغفور له الرجل الكبير الملك حسين وقد ارتقينا أن نعنون هذا اللقاء باب السلام What we have thought of is uh, uh, since the shadow of King Hussein is predominant is to give as a title for this interview Bab Assalam. But before that, we need Your Majesty your approval. As long as you don't refer to the shadow of King Hussein in this house, we celebrate his life and um, I, I think for all the family, this house we feel is illuminated by his life, his spirit um, and his eternal presence. Your Majesty, uh, you have shown a great concern for the Middle East throughout all your life. The Middle East, which you partly belong to. How do you see the situation nowadays in the region? As an Arab and a Muslim, a Jordanian, um, a native uh, of, of uh, the United States, a native Arab American of the United States, um, like so many uh, that I know here, um, full of heartbreak, um, full of frustration and deep concern that is motivating my work, uh, uh, but I also feel so helpless at the same time uh, because I see such divisions in our, in our region today. Uh, I see such deepening socioeconomic um, divisions, sectarian divisions, political um, uh, divisions and, and increasingly hard line and, and intolerant um, forces at play that I feel are sapping the, 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 the energy, the positive energy, the creative um, energy, uh, the confidence that I have seen um, in, in the people of, of, of this region over the 30 years or so that it's been my privilege to live here. So I, I see our, our region at a very dangerous point um, where I pray and hope and through my work I'm doing what I can 
to, to try to strengthen the moderate um, mainstream voices that I know uh, are there, that I know have an enormous power if they will only express, express it and act together um, to help turn the tide of, of division and disintegration that we're seeing in so, on so many different levels. You have witnessed the most promising period for this area uh, when King Hussein was politically engaged in promoting peace between Israel and the Arab world. Uh, how hopeful are you today uh, when you see those politicians trying to find a solution to the ever deeper the crisis in this part of the world? Well, I think politicians of goodwill who are trying sincerely to, to find um, uh, solutions, and you've mentioned one challenge that we face, and an underlying uh, challenge for our region now for so many decades, um, compounded by new challenges exist in the region that um, have only further, I think, um, complicated a resolution of the Arab-Israeli um, uh, conflict and um, added to the suffering of so many uh, others in, in the region. There was a moment of great hope in the 1990s when um, statesmen uh, like King Hussein, um, like Yitzhak Rabin and others who had lived through so much turmoil and so much conflict um, were, were trying to, to look to what legacy were they going to leave for the next generation. Was it going to be a perpetual standoff or confrontation between um, societies who the mainstream of both were yearning for peace, were searching for peace, understood the accommodations that had to be made for peace, but the politicians and political parties were in fact pulling um, uh, the, the, the process away from resolution, or could they transcend those um, different competing interests and work for what was better for all in the region? And they recognized that for any state to live in security in this region, all states had to live in security. For any one country, for any one group of people to be able to live with prosperity and and, and security in the future. It means everyone in the country has to have a stake and has to have a sense of confidence and hope in, in the future. I, since um, the loss of, of the two leaders I mentioned and, and um, different political forces that have, have come to power, um, we, we've lost a lot of momentum, we've lost a lot of goodwill, um, there has been considerably greater suffering, um, and there have been the added dimensions of the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and more uh, foreign forces um, located in our region, and more sectarian divides that are being exploited by, from outside the region, as I, and I think as well from within the region, to try to realign um, the region, in, again, in, a, in polarized, uh, in a way that polarizes different communities living in the region. I think this is terribly dangerous. I think it's very short-sighted. And again, uh, um, my most sincere conviction is that the moderate mainstream of all of our countries and societies have to assert their voices, have to demand that there be an active debate and discussion over these issues that are so central to our future and have to demand that the political leaders of our countries and of our region respect the, the wishes of the majority. Sahibat Ajala al Malika Noor, he gave هذه الحلقة وهذا البرنامج المميز خليكم معنا أصدقائي المشاهدين من تابع بعد هذه الساعة. I think she did the right thing, which is to take a few years and, and she kept a low profile um, and let herself 
grow into the responsibilities and the opportunities of, uh, of being queen, understanding, I think, very clearly, as she did from the very beginning, um, that she was the wife of King Hussein. I mean, they fell in love, they got married. Um, she was not elected Queen of Jordan. She was the wife of King Hussein. There was an agreement between them to become husband and wife. It was a personal relationship that brought with it a certain public uh, persona. They took advantage of the, um, the global attention that was put on them, and uh, certainly her, especially, um, to exploit that in a positive way. If you have a media attention, if you can sit with heads of state, if you can you know, go to international big conferences and conventions, if you can raise money for good causes, if you can act as a catalyst to bring people together to do things that you think are useful, uh, that's, I, I think, how she and the king, to a lesser extent, uh, the combination was something uh, rather fascinating for the media. حقيقة أنا كنت سفير في واشنطن في مرحلة حاسمة من تاريخ الأردن خاصة في الأيام الأخيرة أيضا من حياة جلالة الملك الحسين وأيضا كنت موجود في واشنطن خلال فترة عصيبة من تاريخ الأردن خاصة في أبان أزمة الخليج وكان لجلالة الملك نور دور كبير في تقريب وجهات النظر والتخاطب مع الشعب الأمريكي بلغة يفهمها وإفهامهم الموقف الأردني والموقف العربي من كافة هذه القضايا صحيح أن لجلالة الملك النور ليس لها دور سياسي في الأردن ولكن كان لها دور إعلامي ثقافي واضح وكبير في تلك المرحلة لما كنا بأميركا كانت الملك النور تزور الولايات المتحدة تزور منظمات الأمم المتحدة وكنا كان في مجال نلتقي كنت عم بشتغل على عدد كبير من المشاريع اللي لها علاقة بالدول العربية ويمكن من أهم المشاريع اللي اشتغلت عليها تقرير اسمه تقرير التنمية الإنسانية العربية بقدر أقول لك أنه الملكة نور كانت من أهم الناس اللي كنت أشعر أنه حواراتي معها وأراءها حول هذه التقارير كانت منيرة عميقة وذات منفعة كبيرة بالنسبة لي يعني كنا مثلا مرات نعمل لقاءات بأمريكا ل المثقفين لمراكز البحث والفكر مجموعات صغيرة 20-25 شخص حتى نتناقش بالقضايا الأساسية المحورية سواء كان الحريات الحكم الصالح موضوع المرأة موضوع المعرفة الكل بيستغرب أنه الملكة نور كانت تشارك في هذه اللقاءات وكانت تشارك بجدية كشخص يتدخل في صلب الموضوع وتبدي آراء قيمة جداً هاي سمحت لي أشوف جانب آخر من الملكة نور يمكن ما كنت أشوفه قبل اللي هو العمق الفكري والاهتمام الكبير بقضايا المنطقة وقضايا العالم نعود لمتابعة حوارنا حوارنا الخاص والاستثنائي واللي هو تحت عنوان باب السلام مع صاحبة الجلالة الملكة نور الحسين يوماجيسي يسادة لبنان I wouldn't say your original country but you have roots in Lebanon somehow. Not long time ago, Lebanon has commemorated uh, the outbreak of uh, the Israeli war against uh, its territory in July 2006. Uh, what are the lessons to be learned from this costly tragedy, according to you? I was in the United States at the time and, um, and horrified and um, disgusted by what I saw actually taking place in terms of the human toll, in terms of the um, national toll in, in, in Lebanon, but also in terms of the broader repercussions um, and potential cons consequences for our larger region, but also but what I saw in the United States. Um, and I was very vocal and outspoken during that period of time. Uh, very frustrated that very few voices were discussing what was taking place, that political leaders were, were avoiding the issue entirely. It's a reflection of the political dynamics in the United States where um, most of the political leaders in the country are afraid to talk about 
um, Arab-Israeli issues in any kind of balanced way. It's as strong today, it seems to me, as it was in decades past, in spite of progress that's been made in terms of peace agreements and, and in spite of the fact that um, our increasingly networked and interdependent world means that we have the ability to look more closely at one another to try to understand um, other peoples and cultures more, more profoundly. Nonetheless, there's just a, a resistance to, um, to, to recognizing what was taking place and how dangerous it was for the future. That terrible tragedy has been exploited to try to sow sectarian uh, discord and divisions within our larger region among different communities. And that is unnatural and again terribly, terribly dangerous for the future. I, I know that King Hussein, um, who, who believed and demonstrated in, throughout his work, his reign and his, in his personal life as well as in his, his public life, the importance of inclusion, of dialogue, of respecting one another, no matter what differences of opinion there might be. And only through that approach could we arrive at solutions. I, I see the absence of that today, and it deeply concerns me. The respect of the others. You have had uh, this amazing chance of being exposed uh, to two different cultures, to two different religions, the main two ones, Islam and Christianity. Uh, how do you look at it today uh, from your personal experience at a time where the world seems to be torn up by what is called clash of religions, clash of civilizations? There is no clash of religions or of civilizations, but I do believe that there is a fundamental clash between intolerant um, um, ideological powers and the um, majority aspirations in all our societies to live in peace and security, um, to live according to fundamental values and, and um, uh, aspirations that in fact are shared by the th the, the, the children of Abraham, the three monotheistic faiths, from Adam to, uh, to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and throughout the course of, our, um, of the history of these great faiths, the same fundamental values are reinforced over and over. And the children of Abraham that I meet in the Arab world, in, in, in the uh, West, in the United States, in other parts of the world, fundamentally the majority aspire to live, their hopes, their dreams for themselves, their families are almost identical. They want to live, as I said, in peace and security. They want to have adequate health care and education. They want jobs so that there's a possibility that their children could live a better future than they. So I, um, I, I object to the term clash of religions and, and clash of civilizations. There's a rich texture of difference and similarity in our faiths and, and in our cultures as well. And none of our cultures or faiths teaches us to shun the other. In fact, um, it is in, in our faiths that I think we can find the foundation for living um, in peace together and benefiting, you know, finding the, the, the ways in which we can, our faiths and cultures can mutually benefit and, and, uh, and, and inspire us. I think the media has a very important role to play. Um, and, and it has, to date, I think, not played a constructive role. In, in many cases, um, media imagery um, exacerbates um, ignorance and stereotypes. And one of the, um, the King Hussein Foundation, one of our latest uh, projects launched in the United States is called our Media and Humanity Project. And it's, going, it's bringing um, primarily films, um, it will also look into television content, but primarily films from the region that reflect um, the, the realities of, of the culture, of the um, different communities living on the ground in this region, and, uh, and their search for 
uh, security, for peace, for, for prosperity, to audiences in, in, in the West so that it, they have something in addition to the he sensational headlines and the political, narrow political rhetoric, another way of looking at this region and its people and the search for peace. <laughs> You say that all the religions are willing to live in peace, but at the same time, the extremism is rising. Uh, but you're talking about extremism that is ideological, um, that, that, that is, religion is not an ideology. Religion is a faith and, and, and um, a, a system, I don't know any religion that is um, an ideology that believes that it, it is the only um, uh, belief system that anyone should have or that requires that everyone has to believe only what that system teaches. Um, in Islam, let there be no compulsion in, in religion. I mean, um, extremism needs to be uh, defined away, I think, from our faiths and our religions. But the way it's interpreted in the West yes. is uh, a political Islam. How could we fill the gap between this political Islam and the West? Extremism is rising. What can we do? Well, it's how do, uh, it down? how do we deal with it within our own societies, just as in, in, um, in the West you, th th there is, uh, they, they have to deal with um, fundamentalists or extremists in their own mm -hmm. faiths and in their own cultures. Um, we have to, I think, first and foremost, before looking outside of, of um, our um, uh, family, if you will, um, look at what we can do, what we, what we must do when our religion is being exploited by political ideologues to accomplish political purposes rather than sp spiritual purposes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what people might describe as, as um, um, uh, I mean, I, did, I make a distinction between extremism and fundamentalism. And I make a, a distinction between um, the many different shades of belief among Muslims, Christians, Jews, and others yeah, uh, in, this in is the, the world. Way it is but when we're talking about a militant, extremist, uh, political movement, that is not religion. That that is, uh, and throughout history, we have seen religion used as a ju as a justification for doing very, very irreligious acts. And, and uh, today, it's, we have a responsibility. I come back to the moderate, mainstream center of our uh, communities in, 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 in the Arab and the Muslim world. We have a responsibility to, to, to discuss more openly and more freely, as was the, the, the tradition in the Muslim world from the beginning, our faith, and, and, and to assert our beliefs. Um, and, and to clearly uh, distinguish what we believe is acceptable and, and a true reflection of, of our faith and what is not. But there's a great deal of fear, a great deal of intimidation, and that Muslim discourse which needs to take place and needs to reinforce and, and, and to provide a, a, um, a context in which Muslims feel free enough and, and strong enough and, and safe enough to speak out is missing. And I think that is a responsibility that we have to begin with within our own societies to, to make that happen. And is the
أسست هي مؤسسة نور الحسين وهي المؤسسة الصحيح شجعت كثير وغيرت من نمط الأشغال اليدوية والحرفية في الأردن واهتمت كثير بالحرف مشان من خلال الحرف كانت المرأة البدوية والمرأة القروية استطاعت إنها تنتج وتطور الحرفة اللي كانت متعودة تعملها على مدى سنين وتأسس دخل إلها اللي تستطيع إنه تعتمد عليه في الحياة وبعدين هي اهتمامها بالتنمية الاجتماعية كتنمية من أوائل بدايات مفهوم التنمية الاجتماعية كتنمية اجتماعية مش عمل خير فقط كتنمية شاملة بدأ مع مؤسسة نور حسين اللي أسستها هي والملكة نور كانت دائما عندما تشعر بأنه حدا عم يتألم تشعر بنفس الوقت كان إلها كان لها دائما لمسة تلمس الواحد على كتفه بغمرة صغيرة أي شخص مش مش بس أصدقائها عندما كانت تزور مراكز في القرى أو في مراكز تنمية اجتماعية وتشوف حدا متألم أو حدا يجي يشتكي لها دائما لها غمرة لمسة اللي يشعر معها الإنسان كأنه هي أنا حاسة معك أنا معك أنا أشعر بشعورك I think she realized soon after she became queen that she could actually bring about change. She could influence people's lives. She could initiate things. She could change certain ways of doing things. She could bring people together. She could inject new ideas. There was a whole uh, new world in front of her, which was partly the responsibility of being the king's wife and being the queen, being a mother. Uh, but with the responsibility was also the opportunity and the capability uh, of using that position to get things done. And it was very much um, in the worldview of, a, uh, of an architectural urban planner, which is basically what she was, what she studied at Princeton. <laughs> Your Majesty, why did you need to write your autobiography, Leap of Faith? There were, I, there were probably a variety of reasons that, that, um, uh, that drove me to write. I'd never planned to write an autobiography, certainly not at, at what I consider to be a young age. <laughs> um, and, you know, I thought maybe when I'm old and you know, in my 80s or something, if I'm blessed to live that long. But um, sure. after the death of my husband and having struggled by his side for so long to promote um, better understanding of our region, uh, of its people, of um, the, the context for the politics that were not that that's, we're dividing rather than than um, finding the, the 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 solutions necessary to grasp. Uh, I felt that his search for peace was not well understood within his own community, let alone um, in the West, and that that story, um, historically as well as in you know the more recent um, decades of effort, needed to be better understood. Um, in, in order, I hoped, for um, decision makers in the United States to be held accountable for, um, for, for the policies uh, in the region which could either promote peace and promote consensus building and dialogue and, and uh, the kind of accountability on all sides of the Arab-Israeli divide in particular that is necessary if you're going to, to achieve peace or not. Um, I also felt that Jordan and, and, um, uh, and, the, and the Arab and the Muslim world had so little understanding, so much ignorance, so many stereotypes um, so prevalent in, in the West that my story could be one vehicle for helping people to understand perhaps a little bit more and then perhaps to, to be inspired to reach out for more information, to read more, to, to seek out other sources. 
So I was motivated to a great extent by a, a feeling of responsibility to my husband, to his work for peace, and to whatever modest way I could contribute to trying to advance an understanding of that in the broader world. This story was beautifully perceived. You know, frustratingly enough, um, it, um, it, it still has not had an Arab publisher. And this is a bit of a commentary um, on publishing in the, in the Arab world, uh, which was first raised in the Arab Human Development Report in 2002 and 2003, um, where publishing in the, in, in the Arab world is, is about 1.1% of world publishing, while we're 5% of the world's population. And I think in, in the 2003 report, they said something like the Arab book is an endangered species. So it's not just my book, obviously, but um, I've heard stories from others that the publishers, even in Lebanon, with such a, an important and long history of publishing, so vital to our region, the publishers there want the, the writers to pay for the publishing of a book because they're not convinced that there are going to be enough readers to justify even a very small run of that book. Uh, so the, the, the books that are out there far better than mine, far more important than mine by Arab thinkers and, and, and intellectuals and scholars and statesmen don't have a very broad impact. So most Arabs have read it in, in French or English. Um, it's been published in 16 languages. It's been a bestseller around the world. But it's so frustrating to me that uh, it wasn't possible to find uh, yet a, a solution um, within the Arab world. But my book is not so important as all that. Um, what is important is that there be more writing that takes place in this region. and and and. Uh, more reading of credible accounts. I think one of the reasons there's not enough publishing and not enough reading, we have diminishing reading in the region, is because people are very suspicious about what they're given to read. Most of it seems to be propaganda. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so what does get distributed and financed out there is paid for by people who are trying to sell a message rather than people who are trying to provide a historical context um, for people to look at the world today and, 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 and imagine the future. I tried to do that in my book. I tried to be as objective as I could about Arab-Israeli peacemaking, about um, our region, about many of the challenges and, 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 um, and controversial issues that... Um, so if I write again, I, I might try to delve into some of those a, a little bit more. But Did you expect such big success? No, I, I actually knew that my book, which I had primarily written to read, reach as broad as possible a Western audience, um, so that as as broad a spectrum of people might have a better understanding of my world, of the of Jordan, of the Arab world, of of uh, the search for peace. So I knew in the book there was a a little bit of something for many different kinds of people, but I didn't know if it was a book that would have an audience, you know, that there might just be a little bit here for this group or that, but it might not be a book for anybody um, in, 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 in its whole form. So I was quite stunned. I had never thought about bestseller lists or the, um, I had hoped it might have a meaningful impact on a few, on a few lives, and I was very gratified. I am very gratified that it continues to have an enduring impact. Your autobiography was entitled Leap of Faith and the subtitle was Memoir of, of an, an Unexpected, unexpected Life. life. <laughs> Which part of your life was actually unexpected? Every part uh, of my life has been unexpected. Um, and I, there have been some extraordinary, um, I've been blessed in extraordinary ways. I have um, been offered uh, unimaginable opportunities to serve as I had hoped from a young child in, in the public sphere, uh, to try to contribute. I'd wanted to be a Peace Corps volunteer as a young American growing up, to try to um, in involve myself um, with others from other cultures and other parts of the world as a member of a of a team or a family trying to find solutions to 
uh, developmental um, challenges. I've been in blessed to, to meet uh, and to continue to meet people from all walks of life in all parts of the world to continue to inspire me and I've had some extraordinary experiences and um, I, I, uh, I couldn't say what it was more. The least expected was King Hussein asking me to marry him. Absolutely. I never dreamt of being a, a, a royal never occurred to me, even as King Hussein and I became friends and found common ground in our political idealism and our uh, optimism and, and um, even though we'd come from very different backgrounds, uh, we found we had an enormous amount of common ground just in terms of our, the way that we looked at the world, the way we hoped that our lives could be useful um, to the world. But nonetheless, I never imagined that um, we would make a life together. And it took me quite some time to, to accept the idea when, when, he, when he proposed it because I didn't think of myself as... as um, um, it was the present of your life. No, I wouldn't say it was the present of my life, but it was the most extraordinary leap of faith that I could have ever imagined anyone taking in me. You mentioned in your book that the favorite singers of King Hussein were Fairuz, he loved Farid Fairuz. Atrash, yes. Johnny Matisse, yes. and the Abba group. Well, he, well. <laughs> <laughs> I had to include that because they'd won the Eurovision Song Contest right before we married. It seemed that King Hussein used to sing for you the everlasting hit, Take a Chance on Me, <laughs> with the Abba group. And you even mention and you say that your heart used to melt when King Hussein used to sing that song for you, take a chance on me, honey, I'll be free. <laughs> Was your life a twist of fate or a stroke of luck? My life, by the grace of God, is what it is. And I take each day as it comes, and I'm thankful for uh, my blessings. I'm thankful for our family. I'm thankful uh, and, as, and celebrate the life of my husband and the time that I was privileged to, to um, to, to share with him and uh, for every moment that, that um, I'm, I consider a, a, a um, blessing and, um, and a responsibility to do what I can. One of the blessings too uh, uh, is definitely your four children, yes. Prince Hamza, Prince Hashim, well, Princess Well, I, 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 I now have eight children. I have two beautiful daughters-in-law and two grandchildren. So that's eight. May God keep them for you. Uh, which of your children do you think is following your steps uh, in regard of your humanitarian and social commitment in the world? All of our children uh, were inspired and, and, and you know, clear day by day um, reveal in their work or in their choices and their hopes and aspirations, uh, a, the, the example of their, of their father, uh, of both of us, inshallah. Um, they are all, they all feel a, a weight of responsibility to, to contribute uh, to, to Jordan, to its welfare, to um, their um, Arab and, and Muslim heritage, and they are all the direct descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This is a huge um, burden of responsibility that King Hussein felt very keenly. At every moment of the life that we shared together, uh, that was an, an inspiration, a motivation, a, a um, you know, his conscience, his, his um, it underlay everything that he did, whether on the personal or on, on, on the public level. And uh, for our children, some have chosen to, to study um, and to focus on, on, on how they might be the best possible Muslims and how they might serve the Muslim, uh, the, 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 the Muslim world in, 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 um, at this time of great challenge and, and um, need. Uh, and others are, you know, are, are focusing on, uh, on trying to play 
the role of bridging different cultures. سحرت العقول كما القلوب بذكائها المتقد وبتفانيها في خدمة قضايا الإنسان أنا ما كان في هذا العالم هي صاحبة الجلالة الملكة نور الحسين ضيفة هذه الحلقة الاستثنائية خليكم معنا أصدقائي المشاهدين من تابع بعد هذه الاستماع. استطاعت أن تربي أربعة أولاد ما شاء الله أولا تعلمهم تكمل اللي علمهم إياه والدهم وهو تعلقهم ببلدهم يعني استطاعت أنها تنمي عندهم حب الوطن وحب الوطن العربي وحب الوطن الأردن واللي كان زرعه في في انفسهم الملك الراحل كانت همه كثير ان تزرع القيم وقيم التواضع والصدق فيهم من اهم الاشياء التواضع والصدق والعمل الجديه في العمل اهميه العمل من اجل الغير كانت تخبرهم انه اذا كنتم امراء فهذه مسؤوليه كبيره تجاه الاخرين تجاه تنمية حياة الآخرين والمساهمة في تحسين حياة الآخرين As a couple um, it was a fascinating um, sort of combination um, and, and I think the combination they fed off each other they complemented each other in, um, in, in many ways I think you could see a change in some of King Hussein's policies, uh, or at least in the manner of his policy making, after they were married. Uh, he became much more, um, I think, dynamic and even in some cases aggressive on some issues, for instance, the environment, um, you know, or other issues like that, that uh, I think clearly there was um, an influence uh, that was partly from their marriage. I don't think, that's my own guess. And her life obviously changed completely when she became, I mean, she became instantly a queen, a mother, a working mother, a Muslim, um, an Arab, um, a wife of head of state. I mean, she suddenly had four or five um, dimensions of her life and character that were completely changed overnight. And including um, a household of children, some very young children as well. I have noticed that I have seen them together, and I saw her as an essential partner. I saw them as as as, as she was a queen, very devoted to the king, and to uh, the causes they both espoused. The two were tied together. Were tied together in a very sort of a constructive and respectful uh, sort of way and working together for a common cause which also I'm sure brought strength to uh, both of them. هم كثنائي غير صورة الأردن بالخارج وإضافة إلى ذلك عززوا أمال الناس بالداخل يعني صرنا نفتخر بانفسنا كاردنيين، صرنا نشعر انه في افاق واسعه رحبه بنقدر ننطلق لها. في كثير من الاحيان عززوا نوع من القيم الجديده، قيم لها علاقه باحترام الحقوق، تعزيز الحريات، نظره جديده للمراه، كيفيه التعامل مع الطفل، كيفيه التعامل مع الخارج والعهود الدوليه. فعشان هيك عم بقول أدخلوا الأردن بمرحلة جديدة ومرحلة بناء دولة المؤسسات اللي هلأ عم تستكمل نعود إلى هذا الحوار الخاص مع صاحبة الجلالة الملكة نور حسين When looking back to what the world considered as a fairy tale your marriage to King Hussein what was the most memorable moment 
the two of you had together? There were so many unforgettable moments. And um, I, I, I don't, there were moments of great joy, of great anguish, of great hope and expectation, of um, intense frustration and disappointment. Um, and I'm speaking mostly here about the political <laughs> world, but also um, as in a, you know as, as parents, as um, um, and, and as citizens, we we were very much like everyone in in terms of our hopes and our uh, dreams and our uh, sometimes successes and sometimes um, failures at, at at achieving what we'd hoped for. I suppose like. Every parent, for me, one of the most, I mean, you can never forget the birth of your children. And um, so if I had to pick one, one moment, uh, I would say that uh, the births of our children were, um, were, were miraculous, extraordinary. Magic moments. Magic moments. Uh, you describe your love uh, with King Hussein as an extraordinary kind of love. What made it so extraordinary? Did I really say that? Yeah. All love is extraordinary. <laughs> I, I, he, he made it extraordinary. Your Majesty, having been brought up in the West, what challenges did you face in assimilating to the Arab world and its customs? Was it difficult? Was it hard? I had lived in the Arab world. I had actually lived and worked in Iran for almost a year before I came to the Arab world for a Brit uh, an urban planning firm. Uh, and then I had lived in the Arab world for a year and a half or almost two years before I married. I traveled around um, to a, a, a number of countries that even my Jordanian friends hadn't, um, Iraq, a, a few times for, for research, uh, Lebanon, of course, Morocco, Egypt, uh, Syria, uh, into the Gulf as well. So I, I'd had an interesting composite uh, a, a, of impressions of, of the region. And I had immediately felt at home in Jordan um, from, I think I describe in my book, from the moment I first uh, my first flight in, uh, just approaching the country from the air, and I'd found my, f my f first friends here and, and um, experiences very comfortable. My friends were well-educated, motivated young women, just like my friends at, at home. Uh, there was a rich historical and cultural context that was new and fresh, but also one that I think, I, because I felt a part of it because of my family coming from this region, never felt alien. It only ever felt like a, a, a wonderful book to be read and, 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 and revealed and to learn. Uh, so I, um, when I married, while there would have been a wide range of you know, responses, I'm sure, on many people's part to uh, King Hussein's new wife, the overwhelming feeling that I received was of being welcomed back into the Arab family. Uh, a Halabi returned to to the Arab world, and that was the most extraordinary um, gift to me. Uh, and only out um, outdone by the extraordinary gift of faith and love shown to me by the people of Jordan when my husband passed away, who reached out to me as if as if I could be an extension of him, which was the greatest honor ever in my life. Did you ever try to get involved into politics after the death of His Majesty King Hussein? Since his death, I have continued areas that I was involved prior that could be considered political in, in my um, working with uh, decision makers in a variety of, of, of different countries on a, a range of different issues. Uh, first and foremost, of, clo of course, closest to my heart, trying to promote better understanding of, of uh, in, the, in the West in particular, of, of the realities on the ground in, 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 in our region, of the, um, the uh, historical and um, economic, social, and political context of 
the range of policies and challenges that we face within our region, but also in our relationships with the West and particularly the United States. So I, I continue in advocating on a variety of humanitarian and disarmament and, and other peace building issues with heads of state and um, other countries around the world, Central Asia, Latin America, the, the Balkans, um, and, um, and, and, and of course uh, here in Jordan in trying to promote um, politics at the grassroots level, um, participatory decision making. And uh, we introduced through the Nora Hussein Foundation probably the first um, development programs that not only were focused on, on um, ensuring that women and um, members of poorer communities in the country were um, able to play a more active economic role and not just as um, charitable beneficiaries of charity but actually as um, um, economically empowered um, contributors to, to society but also that the decision making process uh, around this economic uh, development process um, would be a participatory one in which all members of the community could elect those who would help decide on priorities, how to follow them through, how to distribute benefits. Uh, and uh, so on that level and then through some of our programs that have helped um, to promote a better understanding among young people about uh, the principles of, of, um, of participatory decision making, of, of um, f uh, human rights, of basic uh, freedoms and, and um, um, and, and other issues that are part of um, a political learning process. Um, I've also, that's also obviously an important part. So at all levels I've maintained um, uh, activity without ever, I hope, I pray, becoming a politician because that, um, uh, th th that I haven't seen as the most constructive role that people can play in the political lives of their countries. Your Majesty, how rewarding is this experience from a peace-building perspective? Like King Hussein, I've always thought of myself as a public servant. And public service attracted me from a very young age. Uh, and I, in the years that I have been most privileged to play a role as a, as a public servant in, in my years with King Hussein and, and continuing on today, I have known um, in, enormous challenges and uh, the, ho the whole range of, of, of emotions from um, you know uncertainty a, a, about you know even how to begin and then um, how to draw together people who could um, help develop uh, a vision and, and a, um, a set of ideas that, that might enhance so I found particularly rewarding perhaps where we could introduce a new idea and, uh, and, and work hard at developing enough of a success of that idea that it would be imitated and replicated and become a part of the development process in this country and also in other countries in the region where we've seen people's lives dramatically shift from being dependent to being independent and active actors in, in their own um, lives and, and, and being able to contribute to, their na to the national um, community as well, especially where women are concerned. While heading to Amman this morning, I was reading in the newspapers an interview with Hillary Clinton uh, who thinks and who strongly believes that the more women uh, are in power, the more peaceful is the world. Do you agree with her? I, I believe that women have demonstrated, and we've seen this in a number of um, uh, countries and cultures um, uh, over actually a long span of history, women bring special perspectives and approaches to, to development, to peace building, to conflict recovery. Uh, they, women tend to be more inclusive. They tend to recognize that in looking after the best interests of their children and their families because this is a fundamental um, need that I think most women do, do not lose that, 
that drive even within the political arena, though some women do. Um, in doing so, they focus on the kinds of issues that are really central to security, that are really central to peace and, and prosperity. And those happen to be the issues surrounding human security, um, health, education, um, uh, uh, the, the opportunities that need to be available to everyone in society for the entire society to be secure and to thrive. So I think that if we saw more women in power, um, more women valued and included in the decision making process, we would see more peaceful and more stable societies. Um, we've seen countries like Rwanda and Bosnia and, and Sri Lanka and others turn, and Liberia, turn to women leaders after conflict because those women represented a more unifying force, a more inclusive and a more hopeful mm. prospect for the future. And we saw what, what women in, in Northern Ireland, in Bosnia, and women in the Middle East, though they haven't been as active as as, as they can and they must be in order to really turn the tide. But women in the Middle East are also playing a central role in reminding the politicians, mm -hmm. most recently in Gaza, women marching on the street, saying that they're fed up of the, the, the violence, of the disunity, of the sectarianism. They want a, a, a society that is more focused on the essential needs of, of its people and they want peace and they want um, you know, a, a more hope for their children and for their children's children. صاحبة الجلالة الملكة نور هي ضيفة هذه الحلقة وهذا البرنامج المميز اللي هو تحت عنوان باب السلام السراحة أسيري ونود من بعد خليكم معنا أصدقائي المشاهدين. followed uh, his uh, career and his uh, statements and actions for a long time before I met him in New York. It was an interesting meeting because uh, I was looking forward to meeting him because of who he was and what he has done. But it was also very clear when you meet him that he is a man who was at peace with himself. A man came across as harmonious and as influential as he was, I'm not sure even today I can tell you that I saw a difference between the king and the man. He came across as himself, an aristocrat, a man who was at peace with himself in this environment and uh, one cannot say that about many uh, leaders because sometimes when people get into position of authority and influence their whole being their mannerisms their approach changes الملك حسين كان عنده رؤية كان عنده مشروع نهضة ولتنفيذ هذه الرؤية و المشروع اللي بباله سواء على الأردن على مستوى الصعيد المحلي الأردن أو فيما يتعلق بالمنطقة العربية ونهضة هذه المنطقة كان بحب يستقطب الكفاءات وبحب يستبقيهم وبحب يدعمهم وكان يتعامل مع أغلب الكفاءات بنفس الطريقة كان الإنسان يشعر بالارتياح أنه عم بتعامل مع زعيم ومع قائد عنده وجهة نظر عنده رؤية بس ما عنده مانع إنه يستمع للرأي الآخر وهاي كانت من أهم ميزات الملك حسين جلالة الملك حسين من الصعب واحد يعرفه ما بيتأثر فيه ومن الصعب إنه لا يترك أثر على حياة الناس اللي حواليه والناس اللي أبعد فما بالك زوجته ترك أثر كبير على حياتها ولكن ظلت شخصيتها هي مستقلة 
لا لا شك انها ساعدته في كثير من الاحيان في المواقف الصعبه اللي كان يواجهها. امراه ذكيه جدا نور الحسين، امراه ذكيه و دؤوبه شغيله لما تحط امامها هدف توصل له باي طريقه اللي كانت عمليه وجديه. نعود لمتابعه حوارنا حوارنا الخاص والاستثنائي واللي هو تحت عنوان باب السلام مع صاحبه الجلاله الملكه نور الحسين يور ماجستي اتس فير هيومن اند فير اوردينري ذات يو وينت ثرو سم هاردشيبس ان يور لايف هاو ديد يو مانج تو كوب اي اي هاف اولويز تراي تو ابروتش هاردشيبس اند ديفيكولتيز by remembering that they're nothing compared to what so many other people I know are dealing with in their daily lives or, or uh, have had to uh, face in their lives. That has always been an enormous help to me. And then that was reinforced by watching and learning so much about what my husband had had to and, and was on a you know, regular basis as we were married dealing with in terms of Um, situations and people and um, um, you know various um, various aspects of his of his um, life and his work and he never lost his humanity he never lost his hope and his faith and his fellow man uh, he, he only was strengthened as 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 a as a Muslim as, as, a, as a man as a parent as a statesman by the hardships that he faced. He never allowed them to make him bitter. He never allowed them to look for the easy solution. He, he, he persevered with the most indomitable, unshakable faith in God and himself and his fellow man that I've ever seen. So that also was and continues to be an enormous support to me in difficult times. When did you first find out that King Hussein was ill? We found out in... Um, In, in the summer of 1998, uh, when after he had unsuccessfully tried to, um, to uh, recover from uh, some fevers, some intermittent fevers that he'd suffered from, we, we in a checkup at the Mayo Clinic, um, they diagnosed him with um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, that, of course, was an enormous shock for For all of us, he took that you know, horrible news, and against the advice of more traditional um, people around him here and 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 who were with us in in, in um, on, on the trip, he made it public right away, um, and and he did so because his belief was that. Uh, That, that he had a, a compact, a, 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 a very special relationship with the people of Jordan, and that it was based on trust and, and mutual respect. And, and, um, and, and so in that vein, he shared the news, but he also shared it as someone knowing what a taboo cancer is um, in in our culture, not only in our culture, but in, in, in many cultures around the world where people are so afraid of bad news that they don't seek out the truth, the, the, you know, the, the um, facts of, of, of their conditions or, or their loved ones' conditions, and so often lose their lives. They don't uh, recognize um, the facts then they don't uh, take appropriate treatment, and, and, and then um, where cancer is concerned, that can kill you. Whereas if you do immediately, uh, if you do keep a, a good sense and take advantage of diagnosis that's available for women, particularly in breast cancer, but for many cancers that affect men and women and children, there's a chance that you can survive with the treatment that's available today. We approached it as uh, he wanted to show that he was not afraid. He wanted maybe this to be an opportunity where he could help others in our community and, and others to, um, uh, um, to, to understand that 
cancer is a fact of life and, and that it's important to face it head on. Um, but he also, from that day forward, we, I think as we were sitting, when he first came out of the anesthesia and we were sitting together and, and I had, you know, the, the doctor and I had to share it with him, um, the doctor left the room and, and, and we embarked on, um, you know, the, the, uh, another um, of the many battles that he'd, he'd fought in, in, in his life, this one far more personal than, than, than the others. Did but, he express fears to you? Um, he did not, bur he, he would never have wanted to burden me or anyone with the weight of his fears. I felt how he was feeling throughout much of this process, but we talked about the battle. We were waging a battle against this disease and, and also finding whatever constructive ways we could use our destiny to be fighting this battle to help others as well. And we did not focus on, on, on the fears as much. We, we focused on how we could channel everything we had towards his healing and recovery. And how do you feel you handled the situation of his illness? You know, all I can think of is all that I might have done better, uh, and I think this is probably the case for so many people, especially those, you know, left behind who um, uh, often, you know, don't give themselves the benefit of the doubt um, that they, because they can feel a sense of failure that they did not, um, uh, but uh, I, I, um, I, I'm sure I did the best that I could do. I mean, I was, it was my central focus, and, um, and it was also one of the most enriching um, spiritually and um, in, in other ways period of my life to go through that with him. I think we both uh, reached a, a, a whole new level of understanding of our faith and, and our relationship with the Almighty and, and, um, and, and, and to the extent that I, um, I, I was blessed with extraordinary, uh, at least I felt, uh, more faith than I'd ever felt in my life before, even when we lost him, rather than my faith being shaken. I, and that carried me through, um, you know, a long time after. It's hard to explain. Your Majesty, most of us fear death. What does death represent to you? I left, lost my fear of death at that time. What do you fear? I, I guess I fear most uh, losing a any opportunity to um, to provide support and help and uh, love where it might be needed. واجهت المرض وفترة طويلة يعني بإيمان بكثير من الإيمان وواحد بيستغرب إنه هل قد ساعدها هذا الإيمان على وقوف بقوة بصلابة اللي استطاعت معها أن تكون دائما يعني تقدم الراحة النفسية للملك في في مرضه دائما ابتسامة دائما تشجيع دائما خدمات سريعة حتى لا يضطر إلى طلبها هو ولا مرة أبدت خوف أو قلق أمامه على المستوى الشخصي لا زلت أذكر كثيرا الرحلة الأخيرة التي أخذناها في الطائرة التي أقل جلالة المذكور وهو الملك حسين من روشستر إلى عمان كانت رحلة حزينة جدا كنا نعرف تماما وضع جلالة الملك ولا زلت أذكرها بكل تأثر وبكل أسف لكن أنا بالفترة الأخيرة اللي هي قبل أن يسافر السفرة الأخيرة ويعود العودة الأخيرة جلست أنا وياها جلسة طويلة وأفرغت كل دموعها بدون ما يعرفه 
انا وياها لحالنا في في الغرفه كانه كان هذا التدفق بالدموع على كل الاشهر اللي مضت ما بعرف اذا لحالها في غرفتها كان تدفق ايضا لكن بهذيك الجلسه حسيت انا انه كل ما جمعته من قوه ذرف في تلك الدموع We don't appreciate the value of peace until we lose it. We don't appreciate the value of health until we lose it. But to have someone in that region in particular who constantly reminded us that peace is invaluable, we should aim for peace, we should aim for harmony and stability. It's a very, very important gift and a message we should all heed. My husband always said uh, that the most important thing for him was to live with his conscience. And, and this is what I remind my children over and over again, and myself. Uh, the, 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 the most important thing is to, is to live with your conscience and, and you know, Inshallah, that conscience has been, um, ha has been um, nurtured and, and, and um, uh, drawn uh, its um, inspiration from uh, both you know, our faiths and our, our, our religious and, and spiritual values, as well as our experiences with our fellow man. And, um, that is what um, motivates me every moment of the day, is to try to live true to, to my conscience, to what I know is right and wrong, to what I feel is the responsibility that each and every one of us has to try in whatever way we can. And there's a way that we can all, no matter who we are or where we come from, try every day to make a difference. Between Noor and Lisa, the queen and the woman, the wife and the widow, the working lady and the symbol. Do you feel those contradictions? No, they're just one person. One very simple, ordinary person who has um, been blessed with extraordinary uh, opportunities and, and joys and, and, um, uh, and, and the challenges that motivate one to, to keep um, as I said before, just trying to make a positive difference in the world. Noor means the light. Yeah. You've been the light. Most precious gift of my husband to me, that name. You've been his light. Well, I, I hope I was in some measure, I pray. Today, what cause makes you shine as much as you used to shine when King Hussein was alive? The joy and privilege of being alive, of uh, just being here, and, um, and of all those who I love and have loved and who are um, uh, a, a part of, of, of my life today. Did you reach inner peace? Oh, that's a, that, that is a constant um, uh, struggle on a, on a daily basis, actually, let alone in, in terms of one's uh, larger life. I, um, I have known moments of extraordinary um, peace, and I, I spoke a little earlier of that, and I, um, uh, but, but, but my day is full of all manner of uh, distracting impulses and, 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 and challenges. So uh, inner peace is something that uh, is a blessing when you, you feel it, but it's never to be taken for granted. And it's always going to be a part of ever understanding oneself better, of, of, of studying and learning and, and, and pushing oneself to, um, to grow and, and, and to uh, as my husband did, he, he, um, he, he uh, as a Muslim, he used to read the Quran full, throughout, from beginning to end, throughout the year, over and over and over again. 
and every time he understood it in a new way. And, um, and, and I think that that's what life has to be about, um, always trying to understand more. Your Majesty, it has been a privilege to conduct this interview. I thank you and once again thank you for your trust. صاحبة الجلالة الملكة نور حسين كانت الضيفة الاستثنائية في هذا الحوار بالفريد يلي كان تحت عنوان باب السلام أجرينا هذا الحوار من قصر باب السلام في المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية على أمل تكونوا استمتعتوا بهذا الحوار الدسم بتشكركم بشكر وفائكم وتصبحوا على خير الملك حكم 45 سنة وبنى هذا البناء الكبير للأردن ونقله من, من, من مرحلة إلى مرحلة لكن هي بتساهم في نقل في الحفاظ على اسمه دوليا عبر مؤسسة الملك حسين وعبر المثل التي آمن بها آمن بالسلام وآمن بتعليم الأجيال وآمن بالحياة الفضلة للناس فعبر هذه المؤسسة تحاول أن تستمر الرسالة أنا أعتقد أن جلالة الملك سيذكر له أنه أرسى قواعد الأردن الحديث وأنه أسس الأردن الدولة ونقلها من مرحلة الصرع على البقاء إلى مرحلة الازدهار والتطوير وخلق مؤسسات حقيقة دامت بعد رحيله وكان الكل يقول بأن الأردن هو الملك حسين والملك حسين هو الأردن لكن بعد ما مات تم الانتقال بشكل سلس تماما والأردن الآن يشهد ازدهارا وتطويرا أرسى قواعد الوحدة الوطنية التي طالما نادى بها والتي طالما قال أنها من أساسيات الأردن والتي من شأنها أن تغني التعددية السياسية والثقافية في البلاد. I think history and the people of the region and around the world will remember them as compassionate, reflective couple trying to do the best they can in a region that was perhaps the most precarious and the most turbulent. But through it all, they kept that serenity, uh, that dignity, and that faith and hope that peace is possible, that peace is an objective worth living for and working for not in a, a shrill sort of way, but in a calm, reflective, determined and sustained manner.